Hi, and thanks for stopping by. If you're new, welcome. On this channel, we talk about true crime and sketchy stories, while I draw portraits to honor victims or to track down perpetrators. And today, we are going to be talking about the Dupont de Ligonnès family murders in France, which happened 10 years ago. It's the 10 year anniversary this year, actually. And I have to say in advance, je suis désolée to my French friends for any mispronunciations. I will try, but it might get a bit dodgy at times. I'm going to be sketching what I think Xavier might look like today at 60 years old. So let's start with him. Xavier Dupont de Ligonnès was born on 9 January 1961. He was the descendant of old French aristocracy. So his father was a count or something, or his grandfather was a count. And Xavier took great pride in this noble heritage, and he actually said, once upon a time, and I quote, I think I've got a superiority complex. You could call it that. I belong to a group of people who are intelligent, determined, balanced, and in good moral and physical health. Such people are rare compared to the masses. End quote. Yes, Xavier, you are truly a special kind of douchebag. But... Despite his father's very noble heritage, he wasn't very successful. He actually ended up leaving the family in a lot of debt and going to West Africa. He left his wife, uh, Genevieve and um, Xavier, and his two sisters, Veronique and Christine, in dire straits. His mom, Genevieve, was very religious and she ran a small but devout prayer group. He grew up in Versailles, and so did his future wife, Agnès, who he met when he was 20. They fell in love, but they ended up going their separate ways. He went to travel in the United States with a friend, where he had a cousin in Jacksonville, and seemed to grow a fondness for American muscle cars and country music. And the two of them were actually planning on importing cars from the US to France, and it sounds to me like this may have been quite a dodgy plan, but in any event, it didn't pan out. He soon returned to France, and upon hearing that Agnès was pregnant with another man's child, a man who had abandoned her, he married her, and he adopted her son as his own. And in the 1990s, they lived all over France, and in the 2000s, they even attempted to settle in Florida, but this was unsuccessful and actually cost the family quite a lot of money. In the end, they settled in Nantes. The eldest child, Arthur, was 20 years old in 2011 and enrolled in a private Catholic college nearby. Uh, Thomas, the second oldest child, at 18 years old, and Xavier's first biological son was also enrolled in college and he was studying music. Anne, the only daughter, was very, she was very pretty, she was intelligent, and she was 16, and she modeled for mail order catalogs part-time, but uh, she still kept good grades at the private Catholic school she attended with uh, Benoit, which was her younger brother. He was only 13 at the time, and he was very popular and very well-liked. Agnes remained devoutly religious, and she actually worked as an assistant in a Catholic school. Xavier, in the meantime, had a string of failed businesses. By the sounds of things, in my opinion, Xavier was just an asshole. He would, for example, consistently throw it in Agnes's face that he adopted Arthur and he rescued her from her predicament and that she should be grateful to him. So he sounds very emotionally abusive to me. And to top it off, he was physically abusive as well. In 2005, Agnes even filed a police report against him for assaulting Arthur, her eldest son. So, in January of 2011, his father passed away, and he didn't have very much to his name at that time. The only thing Xavier inherited from his father was a long rifle, which he began using a lot and being very interested in, despite never having shown any interest in guns in the past. So the following month, Xavier obtained his gun license, and he began visiting a shooting range nearby, sometimes bringing his sons along. While using his deceased father's rifle at a shooting range is pretty innocent looking, 
but his behavior became even more suspicious the following month. So records show that he bought a silencer for the rifle in March and he told his friends he did so because he didn't want to disturb his neighbors. Disturb them doing what? How is nobody asking questions? And then he went on a seriously disturbing shopping spree. In the weeks leading up to the murders, he purchased cement, chalk lime, bullets, cleaning supplies, garbage bags, a spade, and a trolley. I feel like buying this type of stuff, like even two of these items combined, should at least put you on some sort of watch list for a couple of months, but anyway. On April the 1st, Arthur, the eldest child, did not show up to the restaurant where he worked to pick up his paycheck. And the evening of April the 3rd was the last time the two youngest children, Anne and Benoit, would be seen alive. Thomas, the second oldest son, had returned to school on Monday, but had been called back home by his father, who told him there was a family emergency. So he arrived back at the home that evening, and he was spotted having dinner alone with his father at a restaurant on Monday, April the 4th. On Tuesday, April the 5th, he went to a friend's house, and his last communication was a text sent to a friend on Tuesday evening. Friends then received a long, strange, rambling, four-page letter in which Xavier explained that he had been a covert agent secretly working as a member of the United States Drug Enforcement Administration. By the way, when the DEA was asked about this later, they had never heard of him. Xavier claimed that the family was being moved to America to be placed in the Federal Witness Protection Program. He told people at Agnes's work and the kids' school that they were relocating to Australia. Specific instructions for how to deal with the belongings was also left, and he specifically said, leave the rubble in the backyard, it will be dealt with some other time. On April the 21st, the bodies of the family were found, buried under the backyard patio. Autopsies would reveal that Agnes was shot in her sleep, we know it was during her sleep because she used a sleep apnea machine and the machine stopped working at a particular time at night, which is probably when she died. The kids had been drugged and then shot and their two Labradors had also been shot. The police tracked his movements before and after the murders and it seems that he stayed in the house for a few days after the murders, paying bills, terminating their lease and redirecting mail, and then he drove down to the south of France. He stayed in one very expensive hotel, had an expensive meal, flirted with a woman, and then ended his journey at the Formula One hotel, which is where the last surveillance footage was shot. He only turned his phone on twice during the time he was on the run, and then turned it off permanently. Since then, there have been many sightings, or supposed sightings of him, there was even an arrest in 2019 in Scotland, but they ended up releasing the doppelganger when they did a fingerprint and DNA analysis and found out that it wasn't him. And, uh, there was also a raid on a monastery in 2018, but it turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. Uh, as a side note, if you are watching me draw and wondering why I'm busy giving this guy the biggest forehead that any person has ever had, a five head, if you will, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I have no idea what I did, um, but in a few minutes you're going to see me really commit to this very poor choice and then see the error of my ways and rectify it. Anyway, back to the case. In 2015, a journalist received a photo of two of the boys and on the back it said, I'm still alive. This has not been confirmed to come from Xavier, um, nobody really knows for sure. And there are, as always, many, many theories. So, some of what I'm about to tell you is really wild. Like, you know when something is so outrageous that you're not sure if it's satire or someone is yanking your chain or something? Yeah, well, this is very much like that. But it's from a couple of different sources, including a magazine called Society in France, and there's also a very long discussion about it on the subreddits uh, dedicated to this case. So, I mean, 
take it with a pinch of salt, but go check that out if you're interested. I will link some of the sources below. So firstly, a lot is made of the fact that Xavier had a mistress who he borrowed money from. But in fact, the money he borrowed was for one of his failed ventures. And instead of spending it on the business, he blew it all. So when she discovered this, she was pretty angry and uh, she had actually planned to take legal action against him. So they were not on good terms. Of course, to disappear like this, you would generally need help. So people kind of turned to his close associates to see if he had received help from them. And you may find it surprising that he had many friends who were more than willing to lie for him. The most noticeable is his best friend, Emmanuel. And they had been friends for many years, since the 70s. And Xavier was Emmanuel's one true love. Emmanuel often gave Xavier money and it seems to me that Xavier took advantage of Emmanuel's unrequited love and really, really milked him for all it's worth. Um, Emmanuel was well off, he inherited a fair amount of money when his parents died, but when investigators checked his accounts, they were empty. Some of the money had been transferred to an account in Monaco, and if you know anything about banks in Monaco, they are like Fort Knox. You won't get any information out of them. After Xavier vanished, Emmanuel kind of seemed to lose his reason for living. He became an alcoholic, and he has since passed away, taking whatever secrets he may have had with him. And then there was the friend he went to the United States with. They remained very close, and uh, they even apparently, allegedly, maybe engaged in threesomes with Agnes. And Xavier would send emails to like a group chat with the three of them where he would talk about how big his member is. So charming. Uh, so this friend happened to be in the exact same location that Xavier was in southeastern France when he was on the run. And, get this, one of the two times Xavier turned on his phone Guess who just happened to make a phone call at the exact time the phone was turned on? That's right, this friend. His name was Michel. So remember how they were really into cars and wanting to import cars? I'm wondering if this friend supplied his getaway vehicle. This is just my speculation. But sadly, this friend is also dead. He ended up really spiraling down in terms of his mental health and he ended up taking his own life. So we may never know more. Another theory. So remember when I was telling you about uh, Xavier's mother who led a prayer group? Well, it was not so much a prayer group as what sounds to me an awful lot like a cult. It's called the Church of Philadelphia and it's based on something kind of resembling Catholicism, but not really. Like most cults, it uh, predicts that the world is going to end. And it started with around 20 followers, but it's very hard to say how many followers there are today. The followers paid his mother large amounts of money, and so they basically kept her up and she didn't have to work. And uh, Christine, his sister, born in 1966, was designated by her mother to carry the quote-unquote savior in her womb, which was, and I kid you not, a reincarnation of Jesus and Satan in one and the same person from whom salvation will come. And Christine's husband is part of this same group because his parents were part of the group and that's how they met. They live pretty reclusive lives. Um, at one point, it is rumored that there was a get together with all the followers, and um, this was when Christine was still quite young, and that she offered herself uh, to the men to be able to bring forth this savior. Um, in any event, the police, with good reason, I think, believe that they may have assisted Xavier in his getaway. In June 2011, the post office director in Versailles alerted police that two women had removed a heavy package addressed to, to Xavier. One woman's description met that of his mother, but the police looked for it and the parcel was never recovered. 
When Christine, Xavier's sister, was questioned, she claimed only to have had superficial relationships with him before he vanished, but records of correspondence show that they were communicating weekly. When police searched their home, they found receipts for Western Union payments made to a man called Jovan Soliman in the Philippines. So police obviously look into him. And it turns out he is a priest who is part of a fringe movement of traditionalist Catholicism, um, but they consider the Pope an imposter. Xavier had drifted away from religion in his life, but before the murders, he had become more invested in his mom's movement again. And this apparently really worried his wife, and she spoke to friends about this because she was genuinely afraid of his mother. He ended up making a lot of posts on Catholic chat forums in his final days, well before he left, and they were aggressive and alarming to other people on the forum. His sister Christine says he is innocent and that it's some big conspiracy and those are not the bodies of his family because they don't match the exact dimensions of the people in the family and he had a very bad back so how could he bury them, blah 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 blah. Um, I don't know if that should be taken seriously, but I'm telling you just so you have all the facts. His older sister, Veronique, who kind of broke ties with her sister and mother, good for her, seems to feel really guilty that she didn't see any signs of what was to come. I mean, how could she, though? Uh, she believes he may have committed suicide, but hidden away to do so because it's very much against the Catholic faith to do so, so he wouldn't have wanted his family to know. Some law enforcement officials also think he took his own life, but many think he is still out there and on the run, and I tend to agree with that. He apparently speaks English perfectly with no accent, and he is missing a tooth. Before he vanished, he had, he had a lot of Facebook profiles and a pseudonyms, and uh, he had actually been trying to contact people from his past. This seemed to be especially true for women he had been interested in or had relationships with in the past. To me, it seems like he just wanted to pick up a new life, as though he was still a young single man. So basically, the worst possible outcome for a midlife crisis you could imagine. This checks out because he had turned 50 the year he had committed the murders. I've spoken before about the motivations for family annihilators like this guy and Chris Watts and many others. And I spoke about this in my Robert Fisher video, so you can go check that out. But we spoke about the different motivations for family annihilators. And it seems like this guy could have a combination of all three. It could be that they were under financial stress, which there is plenty of evidence for. So that this triggered it because of the humiliation. Um, it could also be that he just wanted to start a new life and he wanted to be a young man and he wanted to get rid of the burden of his family. And uh, lastly, it could be that he felt humiliated because he was losing his position in the family. He was losing his position as head of the house. He was losing his position as sexual partner for his wife because she was showing interest in his friend. So it could be the trifecta, which would make it very dangerous and um, very, very difficult to profile this guy. So let's talk about my sketch. In my sketch, I've obviously tried to age him a bit because 10 years have passed. So I've added a little bit of sagging to his face, his cheeks, his eyes, uh, deep in some of the wrinkles. I kept his glasses because his eyesight seemed pretty bad and in photos of him you can see that his eyes are not perfectly centered. So this might be due to a condition called strabismus and as a result he would have had to wear glasses at least some of the time or he has to wear glasses at least some of the time even if he might wear contact lenses. The rest of the time at some point he would be wearing glasses so I kept them. He also has a noticeable drooping in the outer corner of his eyes, but it seems to be especially noticeable in his left eye. He had a noticeable receding hairline, uh, so this would be more pronounced at this point, though perhaps not as pronounced as I initially made it. Um, I think he would 
possibly try to grow some facial hair because this would be a pretty good disguise on his face. I actually saw a picture of him with a moustache at the beach and honestly it he looked like a completely different person to me so but I also believe he wouldn't let that get out of hand and have a very sort of bushy rough beard because he seems to consider himself a bit of a ladies man so he would want to look attractive and kind of try to recapture his youthful looks etc. If you have any information that could lead to his capture, please contact the authorities. I will leave the contact in the description box. So that's the end of today's sketchy story. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please subscribe for more and I will see you next week.